Okay, thanks for having me. Um, so just a little bit of background on this. Um, as Natalie mentioned, I've been looking at this topic for a number of years. Um, I was first started with a US Department of Agriculture grant about five or six years ago, looking at water resources use in Western New York. Um, and that led me to ask the question um, to some people um, that were familiar with that about were farmers using the canal? And sort of when I would ask people, they would sort of give a response. Well, we know some farmers might, you know, sometimes stick a pipe in or a pump in, um, but it, it was, weren't many details forthcoming. Um, so at some point, uh, the Canal Corporation, about three or four years ago, they had this competition, the Reimagine the Canals competition, to basically think about ways to kind of reuse the canal, to shift it not just from boating, but to other, other ways of using the canal. Um, and with that, I got a, another small grant to sort of continue to investigate um, specifically how the canal can be used for irrigation. And part of that led me to understand how it already is, but then also how it could be enhanced. Um, so really the talk today is mostly about um, how has it already been used for irrigation. So it was five parts. Um, so a lot of this is sort of actually, you know, some talking about basic engineering, basic infrastructure, but also the first thing to, to start with is basically um, the canal wasn't designed for irrigation, but it actually what I like to say is this fortuitous intersection of geography and infrastructure that allows it to be really useful for that. So we'll first explore that. Um, the second thing is talk a little bit about why would you irrigate in New York, right? I think sometimes that seems like a foreign idea. We get quite a bit of rain, more rain than we might want sometimes. Um, so why are we even talking about irrigation? Um, the third thing is to talk about some unique canal infrastructure. These are the kinds of things, it's sort of the hidden in plain sight part. If you go walking along the canal or riding your bike in Western New York, you might go by these things all the time and not quite realize sort of what um, essential component they provide in terms of um, aid in irrigation. Um, and then the last part is to talk a little bit about the ag economy of Western New York, sort of what, um, what are the benefits um, and, and what's being grown um, that's supported by the canal, and then look a little bit toward the future. All right, so as I mentioned, the, the first place to start is to, um, well, is to just to understand where we are. So while there's irrigation, um, to some degree from, from other parts of the canal, the majority of it is basically between Lockport and Rochester, and the, almost more specifically Lockport and Spencerport. So over here in this, this red box that I show on the screen. So, so that's where we're gonna be focusing um, today is that section of the canal. And as I said, sort of the place to start is to sort of think about um, why is the canal so useful for irrigation if it wasn't designed for it? So the first thing to think about is why is the canal where it even is? Um, so this was um, from a, a figure from actually a report from the US Geological Survey um, from the 70s, where sort of a really actually pretty renowned hydrologist Late in his career, spent some time um, providing this report that, that investigated the hydraulics and the engineering of the canal. So we had this interesting figure to, to make the point that um, when in the early 1800s, when the canal was being conceived and, and designed, most of the population was the United States was on the, the coast. So there was this interest in basically being able to access the interior of the country. Um, but what we had sh shown here by this uh, 500, this line, this topographic line showing a 500 foot elevation was this barrier basically of mountains or other rugged terrain. So one of the few breaks in that barrier was the Mohawk River Valley. So it was logical that the canal should start there. So once it got through the Mohawk River Valley though, they basically had choices. Um, one of those choices was potentially just to use Lake Ontario. Um, but at the time, Britain was just, it was controlled Canada. That was British territory. And they didn't want to unnecessarily send trade traffic um, any closer to Britain than they had to. So then there are choices to basically, how do you go through Western New York, where Western New York was basically was the frontier, it was largely undeveloped. So there were two routes they could consider. Um, the northerly route, which is the one that it ended up taking, which we're familiar with, and then a southerly route. Uh, the southerly route was partially pushed um, because these had speculative landowners that already owned that land and they would have liked to see the canal developed on that land. But the other thing it avoided um, to some degree was, was working its way over what we call the Niagara Escarpment, which we see in Lockport, right? So in the early 1800s, they realized they would have to basically get up over this very sharp change in elevation and then actually also make a cut through, through rock um, to get over to um, the Niagara River and, and Lake Erie. So they were sort of faced with these two choices. Um, but what they ultimately went with, as we know, is they went with the Northern route. And one of the critical reasons they did that was because if they had gone the Southern route, they couldn't have used, Lake Erie wouldn't have been the highest point on the canal. Um, there would have been sort of a high point in the center section 
and Lake Erie couldn't fed water through that entire section. So they were concerned about basically running out of water to operate the canal. By picking the Northern route, they had to go to the Niagara Escarpment and Lockport, but they guaranteed that Lake Erie could be a reliable source of water for this, um, what we refer to as the 60 mile pool. Um, so for this very long segment of the canal. So a reason that made a lot of sense then to basically guarantee a really reliable water supply um, was, is really critical now. And when we think about it in terms of irrigation is we basically have Lake Erie water available um, to provide other, um, to provide for navigation the canal, but then also to provide for, for water for other uses, which includes irrigation. So besides that choice, and this was sort of the more unintentional choice, but to under, understand sort of why it's so beneficial and, and useful is to also understand where the canal is now in this northerly, northerly route relative to Lake Ontario. So the canal runs at about an elevation of around 515 feet in elevation. So here, this is a um, basically a two-dimensional map, but the brown areas are higher in elevation and the greens um, are lower in elevation. So the canal runs along this, this ridge basically around 500 feet elevation and all the land to the north of it toward Lake Ontario is at a lower elevation. So not only can the canal be fed by Lake Erie and that Lake Erie is higher than the canal, but then you have this whole swath of land between the canal to the north to Lake Ontario that's also lower than the canal. So you basically by gravity can feed water um, from Lake Erie into the canal and then feed water into streams that flow north and basically move water out to this, to this large swath of land. So when we talk about irrigating from the canal, we're not just talking about irrigating from literally the canal itself, but also from these north flowing streams that intersect the canal. And that's really kind of the most novel piece of this that offers the most potential. Um, and it really was just sort of this fortuitous intersection, right? They didn't really, when they designed the canal, they didn't have this in mind. Um, but 200 years later, um, it really offers um, a lot of um, value now and, and potential growth. So one thing I just like to make the point of the fact that this is all gravity fed. So I, I, this is a sketch of um, some of the aqueducts from um, Roman times, right? And, and the Romans, they were situated in such a way that they could feed their cities by basically water sources up in the hills. And then they could basically divert all that water just by gravity through their aqueducts um, into their cities. And in some ways the canal it really is working the same way is we're just, it's all gravity fed. There's no pumping. Um, required, we can move water, pretty vast amounts of water, um, long distances, just using gravity with no other energy, where it's been recognized for basically thousands of years. That that's If you can design a water system that way, that's the way you want to do it. So you might kind of ask yourself, well, if you have the canal, how does it not mix with other water from other streams? How do you guarantee the water from the canal is actually flowing into these north flowing streams and not the reverse? Not that the north flowing streams are, are flowing into the canal. And if you look at a map, it's hard to tell, right? So this is just a Google map from just outside of Albion, sort of in the center section that we're, we're looking at. Um, and I just, I just put some circles around some places where the streams intersect the canal. And if you look at it here, you can't really quite tell what's going on. But if you're out there in person, you kind of know what you're looking at. And so this is a, a really good sort of shot of what's going on. Um, right? What you find is the canal is basically is the high point in the landscape. We say the canal is sort of above the grade of everything else around it. So basically any stream that intersects the canal is passing underneath it. So in a lot of cases, those, um, those streams are sort of obscured by trees and other obstructions. But the one that's almost easiest to see isn't a stream, but it operates in the same way. It's the only road that passes under the canal. So this is out near Medina, and this is uh, what they call culvert road. So a culvert is basically any passage or sort of tunnel-like structure um, that usually is carrying water, but here it's carrying a road. Right, so this is a really good shot that's giving you a sense of what's going on is the canal is up high. In those cases, it's usually a stream is down low, and it's then easy to divert water from the canal into these streams. Um, and if you've ever never been out here, it's kind of a neat place to go. Um, you can take your bike through this. You can also drive through it. Um, so it, kind of a, a neat stop if you're ever out in Western New York. So one thing I just want to take a second and provide some more context for, for the novelty um, and of, of this magnitude of water infrastructure. Because um, we really kind of take it for granted, right? We know the canal is there. We don't really... Uh, other than knowing you can go boating on it or walk along it, we don't really think of it as a way to convey water. 
But just to sort of give some context for, for sort of the, the size of it and sort of the uniqueness of it, I provide a map here of a, the Colorado Aqueduct, Colorado River Aqueduct, that connects the Colorado River um, to Los Angeles, right? So in a place like the Western United States where water, it was a really critical resource, right? This is a well-known piece of infrastructure that actually conveys about the same amount of water as the canal in Western New York. It's a little bit more. The canal is around a thousand cubic feet per second. This is 1600 cubic feet per second. Um, but we all sort of know that this is a, a critical piece of infrastructure. If this wasn't there conveying this amount of water, LA, when Los Angeles wouldn't be there. Um, so while the canal itself isn't as essential, it basically does the same task as this piece of infrastructure. Right? This was built for what would be $3.5 billion in 2020 dollars. Right? Well, the canal was really built for an entirely different purpose, um, but basically does, does the same thing. So I think it's sometimes it's interesting is to sort of say, well, if the canal was especially in the Western United States, sort of everyone would know about it in terms of its conveyance abilities. Um, but we don't really usually think about it that way because it's in the East. Which sort of leads up to this question about why are we irrigating um, in New York? Sort of what's the value of irrigating in, in New York State? Um, so this is a, a map. This is uh, from the US Department of Agriculture. And every five years, they take a census of farms and, and farmers will report back on different characteristics of their farms. And one thing they ask about is they ask about irrigation. Um, so this provides a really nice map of sort of percentage of irrigation um, per, per farmland in each county. So the darker greens basically indicate a higher percentage of irrigation, right? And it's not surprising what's happening out west, right? You expect lots of, lots of irrigation out west, or this is a place like Colorado. But what might be surprising is the amount of irrigation in the east, right? So you start to look at places um, like the Del Mar Peninsula um, and then southern New Jersey. But then you also get these pockets of high irrigation in Michigan um, and Wisconsin. Um, and these, I sort of think of these as sort of competitors to western New York in terms of these are relatively cool weather vegetable growing regions um, that have quite a bit of irrigation. Um, and New York has some amount um, but really only one to 4%. So I use the slides in different ways. Sometimes I use this to basically make the case New York should have more irrigation to basically compete with its competitors, but then also to make the case that people find value in irrigating. And really where that value comes from is it allows you to grow um, either a greater quantity of a crop or to basically grow a higher quality crop, right? So in a lot of cases where people are trying to sell fresh market vegetables, um, if it's not the highest quality possible, you'll have a hard time selling it. Right? And that's really what irrigation provides. So even if you have you know, a relatively wet summer, but you have two to three weeks of really dry weather, especially at a critical period of development of your crop, that crop can suffer. And it might go from the difference of having a really high quality crop to just having a, a, a mid quality crop that's much harder to sell um, um, as a fresh market vegetable. So th this is sort of my argument for, there's actually lots of uh, other people in the, the Eastern United States, depending on what they're growing, who are irrigating. Um, and the, and Western New York has some of that, but this is also sort of the case that maybe we can have more. The other interesting thing, which I always like to, to show the slide, um, this is an interesting figure that shows mean monthly precipitation, and this is long-term average. And we do think of ourselves as being relatively wet, but especially when you get to um, along the lake shore, and this can be relatively close to the lakes, um, to Lake Ontario, you actually have a drier band. And we can think of this as, as partially being caused by sort of a reverse lake effect snow, right? So we all know about lake effect snow in the winter, where basically you're picking up moisture off the lake, um, and then it moves um, inland and then drops the snow. But basically what happens in the summer is you have a lake that's colder than the land around it that minimizes convection so you actually can, to some degree, minimize rainfall. So you can basically, at least through July, by August, this sort of starts to end. You can actually have sort of there's, there's dry bands um, in the near lake areas that basically actually make the, the average amount of rainfall similar to what you would see in sort of the, the middle part of Nebraska. So it's sort of a, a curious effect driven by the lake, um, but also even makes it more valuable to potentially have irrigation um, in that area. Okay, so um, just to and just to provide a little more history on irrigation, also you might wonder how long have people been irrigating. So I, I assume farms have been irrigating to some degree um, ever since the canal was put in 200 years ago, but certainly at the time that was probably limited to 
um, farms that were immediately adjacent to the canal. Um, from, from some reading, um, my understanding is that, can, that irrigation really took off post-World War II. So after World War II, they, they had a surplus of aluminum that were looking for something to do with it. And what they found is they can make cheap aluminum pipe. Um, when farmers could get cheap aluminum pipe, then they could actually start moving water um, farther out of their fields and effectively irrigating. Uh, so there was a student, uh, Levi Parker, a PhD student at Cornell in the 50s, um, that provided this interesting survey of, of land that was irrigated at the time. So this is showing Rochester um, and the areas to the west of it. So for people familiar with this, Greece and then Hilton and Hamlin. Um, so there are actually a number of farms, probably now what are suburban areas in Greece. Um, and then moving farther out. So um, Albion is right here and then Medina over here. Um, so showing even in the 1950s, a number of farms, this survey by, by Levi Parker um, estimated about 1200 irrigated acres in 1953. Uh, so for 70 plus years, probably even longer than that, there's been relatively extensive irrigation and this number has since increased. But it's sort of interesting just to sort of making this case for why is it valuable. People have realized for quite a long time sort of what an interesting resource this is. It just hasn't sort of been widely understood other than if you were a farmer in that region. Okay, so along with this infrastructure, and this is sort of the, the hidden component of this, is it, this doesn't just sort of happen. There's sort of interesting infrastructure features that are out there that actually have sort of unique names. Um, so siphons, culverts, weirs, basically all types of hydraulic structures that let the water get diverted to be able to, to support the agriculture. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to sort of explain some of this infrastructure. And next time you're out in Western New York on that stretch of the canal, you could potentially look for some of these things. So one piece is a siphon. So we probably have heard of a siphon before. I do wanna mention that when you look at records or information on the canal, um, specifically for a siphon, they often spell it S-Y-P-H-O-N, which I haven't seen that other places. The typical name, if you look it up in most dictionaries is gonna be S-I-P-H-O-N. But as you might know, if you ever clean your fish tank out or have to drain a pool, a siphon is basically a, a, a tube or a pipe that carries water up over an obstruction and then back down. So here what's going on is we basically have siphons, which are basically PVC pipes that draw water from the canal up over the canal embankment. Usually they're under the canal path and then back down the other side and they usually empty into a stream. So really generically, just to sort of see what, what's really interesting about a siphon is that a siphon doesn't require a pump. So as, as long as you can get this hose filled with water, this tube, um, to basically what we would call prime this prime the hose or prime the tube, it'll just flow by um, without any additional mechanical energy um, as long as the upstream um, water elevation is higher than the downstream water elevation. So what a farmer will do is basically in June, sort of the beginning of the growing season, they'll go out, they'll take a pump out, they'll prime the, the tube or the pipe, and then the siphon will start flowing and it'll just continue flowing through the entire season until the farmer basically shuts it off, closes the valve, um, at the end of the growing season, right? So it's really simple piece of technology, but it's also really efficient in that it will move water, um, but it, it doesn't require any energy to do so. But it's critical to do this, that the, the canal is higher than the downstream outlet, which as I sort of said, was that kind of fortuitous design of the canal. When they designed the canal 200 years ago, they didn't really think about people using siphons to draw water off of it, but it's really an efficient way and effective way to do it. So if you're ever out, right, it doesn't look like much on the canal. It just looks like sort of a piece of white PVC pipe crossing underneath. So here are some aerial images of this. Um, but that's what that is. It's sort of this critical piece of infrastructure transporting water out of the canal, usually into a stream. And, and oftentimes you might look across the canal and you might see a, a piece of a siphon just going up in terms of what looks to be just forested land. And you might sort of, if, you, if you're looking for these things, you might wonder why would somebody have a siphon just heading into the forest? And usually what's going on is at the same time, there's a culvert. So when we talked about culvert road before, um, a culvert is basically any passageway um, or basically a pipe or tunnel um, carrying water. And usually there's a culvert under the canal and a siphon pipe is taking the water up and over the embankment into the culvert and then it's feeding a connect, feeding into a, into a stream that's then flowing to Lake Ontario. And then in some cases, it's also um, maybe connecting to a field that's some distance away. But here's, here's a picture of that. In this case, um, you have a culvert 
um, one part of the, or you have a siphon, part of it's feeding to the culvert that then goes into a stream that goes into the canal. The other part is going to a pump, which then is pumping some distance away to another field. Um, if you're ever out walking, you'll see there's these yellow placards. Um, and this is the, every culvert has a number. Um, so this was culvert 85. So if you're ever out walking and wondering what, what these signs are for, if you kind of look back in the vegetation, what you realize is there is a, a culvert there. Um, and oftentimes there's a, a siphon to go along with it. What, what is also there to divert water is what's referred to as a waste weir and a waste gate. So these are much more complicated structures. These were actually, these are installed um, basically as a way to maintain water level in the canal. So a waste weir is basically an overflow. So the weir is right here. So this would be if the canal level ever got higher than intended, is sort of a safety release valve, water would spill over the top. So this is basically never used. This is sort of a worst case scenario. And usually the, the canal corporation maintains the water level quite a bit lower than the weir, usually about a foot lower. But what is used are the gates. So this is how the canal is drained uh, in the fall. So when they say they're draining the canal, what they're doing is there's these waste gate structures. They open the gates um, and the water then can drain out. But usually during the normal season, they're also making some release from these gates. So um, lots of streams in the area that you don't really think about are actually receiving um, some amount of the water from these waste gates. So here's an example of another one. This one I should mention, this was an Albion. Um, so this feeds West Branch of Sandy Creek. This is actually behind a daycare center, you know, sort of kind of thing, it's fenced off, it's just back there. You know, no one really quite realizes it's there. Um, this is in Holly. So similar basic kind of structure. We're looking at this as an overhead view. Um, this is, there's a Holly Town Park. So you can kind of just walk around this. Probably most people don't quite know what they're looking at, right? But this is the waste gate. There's this sort of um, jet of water that goes into the stream in the woods, which eventually, not very far, a few hundred meters downstream, becomes the Holly Canals Fall Park, right? And probably most people don't quite realize when they see this falls that this is actually canal water um, coming down here. And then it makes its way to a stream um, and then through a culvert under the canal um, and then into the east branch of Sandy Creek. So just sort of a, and if it's, so these are critical for draining the canal, but then these are critical for feeding these creeks that ultimately downstream support these farms. So to give some sense of sort of the magnitude of these, in, these different pieces of infrastructure. So this is our map between Lockport and Spencerport. Um, the yellow dots show locations of the siphons. And this is, I, I made, I just gathered this information from basically biking most of this distance and marking um, with the GPS where those locations were. Um, and then the black triangles are where the waste weirs are. So where these lar larger concrete structures are. And then the blue lines are all the streams that basically receive water from the canal. So there's some other streams in here too um, that aren't shown because they're not receiving water from the canal. But this gives you a good sense of sort of um, the degree to which the hydrology of the streams and this, the north flowing streams north of the canal um, are dependent on canal water. Uh, so you might ask, how much water is this? So a, a good kind of point of comparison, especially for people that aren't engineers, I think, is to think of a garden hose. Um, so your typical garden hose is maybe around five gallons per minute, uh, maybe a little higher. But you know, if you have a, ten, a five gallon bucket and you're gonna go fill it up, it probably takes about a minute or so to fill from a garden hose. So a farmer, um, if you think about how much water a farmer might put on the field, um, in, a, in a dry spell, a typical farmer might put, if you were to, to imagine sort of spreading it over as a depth over their entire field about one inch of water, right? So if it's sort of a, a farmer sort of filling up their field as if it was a bathtub, they'd want to put about one inch of depth on there. So if you have a, a hundred acre field, which is about 2,100 feet by 2,100 feet, that would be equivalent to, and let's see, my, uh, my screen here is getting a little blocked, to around 60 garden hoses um, running continuously. And it's actually not that much water. So in sort of, I'll, I'll switch into some engineering terminology, which maybe um, everyone might not quite follow, but it's about 0 0.6 cubic feet per second. Um, where if you were to look at sort of a small stream, it might only be um, like, it might be 10 cubic feet per second. That might be a pretty small stream. The canal overall though can carry close to a thousand cubic feet per second. So if you have, even if you're irrigating hundred acres, 
it would just be a less than um, one one thousandth of the, the fraction of water in the canal. So here's a little more detailed view of sort of, of um, where there, there might be farms sort of benefiting from irrigation. It's hard to know exactly, um, in part because farmers will move what fields they're irrigating from year to year, um, and also in part because there's no formal requirement to, to basically um, tell anybody exactly where you're irrigating from. So this was constructed by um, using data on and basically certain types of cropland. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture provides information on where crops are planted each year, and then looking at their um, proximity to streams with known canal diversions. So this is sort of an approximation of, of where there's likely um, irrigated land. I think the most interesting thing about this, this diagram is just to show that it's not immediately adjacent to the canal. In a few places it is, but in many places, it's basically some distance from the canal on these north flowing streams. One way we can be a little more sure of sort of is there irrigation going on or not is when there's um, evident, evidence of infrastructure for irrigation. So sometimes it's drip irrigation. That's what most of the orchards use. I don't have a picture for that, but drip irrigation is basically just sort of narrow black tubes that often just run along the ground um, of where trees are planted. So it's really hard to see. But what's easy to see if you're driving by are center pivots. So we often think of this more as, as a Western method of irrigation. So if you see, if you're flying out, out west, out to the west coast, and you're looking down from your plane, you'll see these crop circles. Right, and these are created from basically this, this moving truss that's spraying water as it turns. But Western New York actually has a fair number of these, I think, which is always a little surprising. You drive by a field and you see them out there. And a number of these are, are probably supported by um, water from the canal. So these are all locations where there's, there's center pivot, which sort of match up where we think there's sort of these, these higher value crops that are likely to be irrigated. So in terms of sort of what this does to the, the, the economy of these counties, basically Niagara, Orleans, Monroe, um, what we can see if you were to look at sort of more typical counties across um, New York, as many of them grow, um, you know, have a, a sizable ag economy, but it's more focused on dairy or corn, soybean. Um, but what you'll see here, these three counties are some of the highest um, revenue generating counties in terms of vegetables and fruits and berries. And well, that's, um, I should mention, it's not entirely due to the canal. It's also due to basically fertile soils, and especially for apples and berries, it's also due to the microclimate around the lake, right? So Lake Ontario provides an ideal place to, to grow apples because um, it's a little warmer in the winter, a little cooler in the summer. But it's in part driven by the ability to irrigate from the canal. So this is revenue in terms of millions of, of dollars a year um, for these different, for vegetables and for, for fruits and berries, so primarily apples. Um, and so these are basically within the, especially Orleans County um, is I think one of the top three vegetable and fruit and berry producers in the state. Even despite that, um, if you look at, so what this graph is showing is for these three counties, it's showing uh, total acreage and then it's showing um, estimated irrigated acres. Um, so it's even, it's still a relatively small fraction um, especially for something like grain, right, which is basically corn or soybean. Um, not many people are irrigating that, but what you do see is for something like vegetables and apples, a much higher fraction is irrigated. So if you're to sort of ask, well, what are the main sort of crops that are being irrigated? Um, well, especially for vegetables, um, in Western New York, it's, it's basically kind of colder weather vegetables. So things like cabbage, um, beans, squash, um, some amount of sweet corn, and then those are for the larger farms. There's also a number of small market farms um, that might be more of a kind of a community supported agriculture or organic farms that might grow a wider variety of things. But sort of the bigger acreage are things like cabbage and beans and, and squash, right? And for the most part, um, if the canal or other sources of, um, weren't there of water, um, farmers won't be growing those vegetables. This is, I went in my local supermarket and just grabbed a few things off the shelf um, that I knew were actually products that maybe weren't all the time irrigated from canal water, but had a pretty good good chance. So this was uh, Beets. Um, Love Beets actually is a, um, a Rochester company that came over from the UK that focuses on beets, um, squash, um, beans, um, and then uh, apples. 
And there's a few other things, but these are, if you're ever in store kind of wondering a lot of these, these ones right here are, are likely to be from farms that are supported by the canal. One particular one to talk about is apples. Um, you know, because you think about an apple tree, you don't necessarily think about that's the kind of thing that's subject to a lot of water stress. But one interesting thing to realize is the way apples have been grown in the last 20 years has really dramatically changed. Um, when you go out and you go to an apple orchard now, for the most part, if, if it's a recently planted apple tree, it never doesn't really look like a tree anymore. It looks almost more like a vine, right? So what they have are these, what are called dwarf trees, which look more like a vine. So much more of the energy goes into production of fruit and not much into woody material. So the only way the tree really stands up is to have it attached to these, uh, these wires, these, the spindle system. And at the same time, as you might imagine, the root growth isn't as extensive. So particularly early in the growth of the tree in the first several years, it's very sensitive to dry conditions. So it's become more essential if you're planting these, these new apple varieties to basically be able to provide irrigation to these trees. So as farmers switch over and if people, if you like to get honey crisp or some of these things, some of these newer the apple varieties, they're almost all being grown as these dwarf or semi-dwarf trees. And to really, to, to have ideal conditions for that, those trees, you need to have some amount of irrigation. And that's really a change that's happened really in the last 20 years where it's become more essential. And so besides the farms, the thing to note too, is that by having these higher value crops, they see vegetables and apples, um, it also supports sort of this whole other ecosystem of processors and packers and storage facilities. Uh, so within Western New York, there's a number of fruit packers. Um, so some of these over here, kind of obvious ones. Some of those are from apples, um, same Wayne County, closer to, to um, Lake Ontario, but a number of them are packing apples um, that are basically Orleans County, places that are uh, close to the canal. There's also sort of this, um, a few different food processors. Bonduel is one of the largest ones. I think they have two or three different facilities and they package mostly vegetables. Um, and then Love Beats is another. And then you have something like um, the processor of biofuels, so of corn products, right? So not only do you basically have these farms themselves that benefit from this, but then you also have these processors and storage facilities that also benefit and basically be able to generate these and grow these higher value crops. Um, I've done quite a number of interviews with farmers and one thing they mentioned is even after they've had a tough year or sort of, you know, question, um, you know, is, is Western New York necessarily the best place to be growing some of these sort of high value vegetables? One thing it seems like they come back to, um, especially sort of for the long term as a strategic location for growing, is a way it's positioned relative to potential markets. Um, and there's not many other places where you basically can access much of the East Coast market and then also the Midwest within basically a day's drive. Um, so especially in terms of, you know, a reason why there continues to be sort of high value vegetable and fruit growing in Western New York and why in terms of a future investment, it's something to continue to focus on is in part because it's the proximity to these markets. So going forward, there's a strong case to be made that the canal is sort of a, an essential piece of infrastructure now to support these farms. Um, but if we start to look out at a time horizon, um, say 30, 40, 50 years, um, and start to consider the potential for climate change, um, climate models basically suggest there's a, there's a pretty good chance that the climate will be drier, the summer climate will be drier in New York um, in 30 to 50 years. And we, we might be seeing that now, it's always a little hard to tell what you're actually seeing sort of in the near term, but there's a pretty good likelihood that in the longer term, things will become drier. Um, this isn't necessarily true for the winter um, and other times of the year, but there's, there's, a, there's a pretty good likelihood it would be drier um, in the summer. Um, you know, so if you look at this, not every model gives you the same result. You run at different times, you might see different things, but it's around 50-50. But I always sort of say to people, um, if somebody told you you might have a chance of an electrical fire in your house, there's a 50% chance, would you have your wiring redone? You probably would, right? So if somebody says to you, there's a 50% chance you'll have drier summers in the next um, 50 years in Western New York, um, would you basically identify and upgrade infrastructure that provide, provide the opportunity to, to um, irrigate more fields? You probably would do that also. So I think especially in something that provides benefit now, but then continue to provide benefit in the future, it makes a lot of sense to sort of investigate 
um, and to continue to look for ways to enhance that, that resource. Um, which brings me basically to my final slide, um, which is um, just noting that the Canal Corporation has this ongoing initiative, the Reimagine the Canals Initiative, um, to basically think about ways to not only use the canal for, for boating, but for other purposes. And one of those purposes is for, for irrigation related to agriculture. Uh, so sort of in the coming years, they're basically exploring ways to, to enhance that. So I'll end there and I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thanks, Steve. Um, we, we actually have gotten a number of questions over the course of the talk. So um, the most recent one uh, from Bill was um, who regulates um, how water is like irrigated? I assume Canal Corp. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So um, the Canal Corporation does issue permits for siphons, um, but ultimately the, the real um, kind of the regulator is New York um, State Department of Environmental Conservation. So they've actually, since the, um, there's a change in the law basically until less than 10 years ago, um, anybody that wasn't um, drawing potable water, water for drinking could basically do it without a permit. Um, but partially because they signed the Great Lakes Compact. So there's a compact among the states and in the Canadian territories around the Great Lakes to better regulate water use. So New York State was a signature, signatory to that treaty. Um, New York State basically upgraded the way they, they manage water. So now any water withdrawal um, for whether it's potable or non-potable of a certain magnitude has to be permitted. So now that comes down to um, the DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation. So ultimately they're the ones sort of in charge of that. All right. That actually relates to another question uh, Bill had, um, which was, um, could, could using this water for irrigation at all impact the current uh, issue with flooding on Lake Ontario? Um, not really. So the, the fraction of water is, is, I think, I should have looked this number up, but I think the amount of water going over Niagara Falls is probably somewhere around 100,000 cubic feet per second. And the diversion down the canal is around a thousand cubic feet per second. So it's about a one 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 thousandth of the total water going over Niagara Falls. Um, and and ultimately, the water that isn't used for irrigation is diverted into those north flowing streams that go back into Lake Ontario. So it's it's basically just a transfer. It's sort of a um, a short detour for the water, but it ultimately ends up back in Lake Ontario. So despite the flooding problems in Lake Ontario, it's it's not a diversion out of Lake Ontario. And I think if it actually was, it probably it might not be allowed under the Great Lakes Treaty. So that is another sort of fortuitous aspect of this is if this is a diversion into a different watershed, um, it might not actually be allowed. But since it stays in the Lake Ontario Basin, it's okay. Interesting. Um, I think um, kind of as part of that question, um, so you showed earlier the um, kind of cross section there of the canal and out here, um, we're where the canal dips a bit, then goes back up. So we're, our section of the canal is not being fed by Lake Erie, but the Finger Lakes, um, is there any issue? So I, I've kind of wondered why we just focus Western New York, do the middle and the Eastern sections of the canal have possibilities of also being I think they, yeah, I think they do. I think a lot of that though comes back to the fact of how do you actually convey water away from the canal. So as I sort of mentioned, in the western the canal's above above grade and you basically can by gravity feed those north flowing streams. You can't really do that on any other sections of the canal. So that's sort of the appeal of Western New York. Um, that you, you could certainly do it, but it would require a lot more pumping. Uh huh. Because okay. yeah, there's a question about using cave the lake. Uh, as a possible thing. Um, another question we have is, uh, many streams run dry during summer because drain tiles and ditches are lowering the water tables. Could water from the canal be used to increase stream flow and keep water cooler for fish? Yeah, so especially in Western New York, these sort of the maps I've shown where the, the, the streams are receiving water from the canal, if the, if the diversion wasn't there, there probably won't be really any water in those streams. Um, I think, and it's been, the canal's been there so long, people just sort of assume that's the natural hydrology of those streams. 
Um, but especially if you go upstream in the canal and look and see is there any water in those streams, especially in a drier year, there's probably no water there. Um, so actually, so in a lot of cases, there's streams in Western New York that basically are being fed by the canal. Um, and it's just, it's been that way forever, really, for you know more than people's lifetimes and, and don't even quite realize it. Um, in terms of the temperature issue, um, the, the canal provides um, water, it'll keep a higher flow, but the canal water is actually relatively warm. Um, you know, it's basically it's Lake Erie water, which it's drawn from close to the surface. Um, and then it basically, you know, moves relatively slowly across this, uh, across Western New York. So the canal water um, isn't, isn't really a cold water source. So it's good at, at boosting the amount of water, but not necessarily at providing really cold water. Really? Okay. Um, and, and I know also, um, the, also with the reimagining the canals, they have been doing the thing where they're releasing extra water in releasing. to improve yeah. um, the fisheries. In. And I should mention that. So they have been, yeah, they've been releasing water to sort of enhance the fisheries. Um, by the time of the year it gets to release water for um, trout and salmon, um, the canal is, is at a, it's at a reasonable temperature, but it's just, you know, you, you sort of have this vision of like, oh, release canal water in the middle of July, and we'll get cold water out. In the middle of July, the water's pretty warm. But in terms of for, for fisheries by the fall, it's, it's at a temperature that's reasonable for the, the fish. Hmm. Huh. Um, okay. Um, are there any more questions from folks? Feel free to write them in the chat on Facebook. Um, I know I was uh, curious since the canal is owned by the uh, New York Power Association at the moment. Uh, do you know if, this is kind of totally unrelated to the irrigation, you know if there's any uh, possibilities of increasing kind of hydroelectric power using uh, kind of similar so methods? <laughs> They can't really, they're, they're looking at ways to increase the amount of flow down the canal, but, and there's actually already, um, there's already a fair amount of hydropower generated from the canal. M much more, much more of the water is actually used for hydropower diversions than irrigation. So, um, so that's the kind of, and, and I think in some cases they're basically at capacity, what the, the facilities, the hydro facilities were designed for, they're already getting that amount of water. So, so, to, so the, the potential growth area is more of the irrigation. Gotcha. There had been another question that just reminds me of, uh, has someone calculated the maximum amount of water that can be diverted out of the canal without you? Negative yeah, the, the, there, you know, it's like the issue is that it's, um, which makes it sort of interesting, it's, it's such a flat section, right? But because it's so flat, there is sort of a maximum hydraulic capacity um, to convey water down the, down the section of the canal. And it's a little over a thousand cubic feet per second. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, you mentioned that earlier, I remember. Um, okay, we've got one more question in the comments. Uh, can you get inside of the lakes and part of the canal system? With global warming, do you envision uh, further demands on this water that might affect the irrigation? Um, I think, you know, realistically, I think the for farmers and having talked with farmers quite a bit about this, you know, there's a certain amount of cost in terms of, of pumping and installing piping systems. And in many cases, they're not quite there yet where they'd really see the benefit, you know, cause it's, it's basically, I didn't quite mention this before, but it's, it's supplemental irrigation, right? They, they need it during a dry year, but not in every year. So something like the canal, it's, it's relatively inexpensive to irrigate because it's mostly gravity fed. Um, the streams are already coming close to their property. But if you start to get in a case where like the Cayuga Lake or Seneca Lake where you basically have to pump uphill and you have to pump some distance to get to your field, probably the cost of installing that infrastructure starts to exceed the benefit. So that's why the canal is such a unique case in terms of, of being able to deliver water close to fields, mostly by gravity and making irrigation pretty inexpensive. Okay, and, and since we, most of this water is coming from Lake Erie here, um, just kind of following up on that, um, are there, so I assume our water usage as climate change progresses is supposed to change. Like, do you foresee them needing, like Lake Erie, being not having enough water that 
the DEC or something. It's like, oh, you can't use that now. It's always possible, but given the sort of the magnitude of water in the Great Lakes, I mean, I think it's, it's one of these things, people thought the Great Lake water levels were going down um, and they had been, and then, then we saw this reversal and right now they've been at record high levels. Um, so people, hydrologists and climatologists have found it really hard to predict what's gonna go on with Great Lake water levels. Um, you know, right now, no one would say there's any lack of water. I suppose in 50 years, someone could, could say there is, but in part, I think it's interesting that since really it sounds like the West where you're totally dependent on irrigation, it's really supplemental irrigation to get you through just a few, few dry spells in the summer. So it would still seem like rel money relatively well used to support um, farms in that sense, that, that not that much water could kind of go a long way in terms of, of sort of producing high quality crops. Okay, yeah, well, um, thanks. Um, yeah, there's a lot of water in the Great Lakes, from what I understand. So um, I think that's it question-wise. Um, thank you very much for presenting. Uh, I find I was on the uh, Reimagine the Canals kind of commission, and when I heard the presentation on this, I was blown away by the potential of this. Um, so uh, I love this project, and uh, I hope all you folks out there uh, in cyberspace uh, also enjoyed it. Um, so um, thank you very much and uh, looking forward to hearing more about this in the future. Great, thanks for having me. I enjoyed talking about it.